the last month we went to Mexico with this Cancun vacation. So she kind of I spent many years home. like this with my kids. All right. We had an email. I think I have a glass of water. We have a so now we're going to go into a completely different discussion. Still, we're still dealing with things going bad. But we're going to look at it from a different context. And it's not only things going bad, actually, but how to prevent things from going bad. But we're going to talk about governing agreements within entities. This is when things, there are disagreements among partners or shareholders. I'm going to call them partners. So let me just let me disclaim from the beginning so I don't bounce around with terminology because it really all deals with the same thing. Whether we're dealing with a corporation which is owned by shareholders, which is managed by directors, which is actually operated by officers, or a limited liability company which is owned by members which is operated by managers, unless you give them another name, which you can do all kinds of things, or a partnership agreement, which can be owned by either general partners or limited partners, and is managed by managing partners, general partners, whatever labels, or just in a smaller operation, the partners themselves. So those are the terms that describe who the people are. For purposes of the discussion, and to, so I don't have to keep bouncing back and forth amongst them, I'm just going to refer to them as partners. They're co-owners. Fewer syllables. It's co-ownership. And what we're doing here is we're going to go through some agreements and, and how co-owners or partners in a venture, which typically for our purposes owns real estate, get along with each other and what they provide and what they agree. For purposes of a corporation, and even a limited liability company, an agreement is not required. One more time. An agreement is not required. It's pretty stupid not to do that, especially if there's a lot of money involved, but it's not required. In a general partnership, a general partnership is the only entity in Florida that can be oral. I want to make that clear because that's got some interesting consequence. A general partnership is the only entity in Florida that can be verbal, oral. Why would you want that? Or why would you use that? Well, I'll tell you a very practical time that I've used it. Today is Saturday. What happens about 11 o'clock tonight? Yeah. Anybody know? The Florida Tallahassee? Come on. Somebody. And the week. 11 o'clock Saturday night in Tallahassee, something happens. You've watched it on TV. I guarantee you've watched it on TV. A lot. Lottery. Thank you. <laughs> so, I had a, and I've represented a few lottery winners over the years. Okay. So what happens is, let's say in this particular case, the person won $15 million. And for tax planning, they want to be able to share that money with a spouse or children. Because if it all comes into the one person, there's going to be a huge tax bite, not only income taxes, but there's also going to be an estate tax bite when they go to when, when the money gets passed to the next generation, or a gift tax if you want to give some of the money away. So what you do is they all the people, the whole family goes running to Tallahassee with the ticket and say, Hi, we are the Smith Lottery Partnership. And we have a partnership agreement, a verbal partnership agreement, that we, this whole family, has contributed to that dollar, and we want this ticket. And we want the checks payable to the Smith Family Partnership. And everybody signs a piece of paper, or the parents sign to the kids if the kids are underage, and the lotto distributes to the, you know, either the, the lump sum or the annual installments to the Smith Family Partnership. Then we do things fancy like um, we convert the Smith Family Partnership into a limited liability company, and we have an operating agreement, and we make Mama Smith the managing partner, and she invests the money, and she makes sure that the money is properly taken care of so that the whole family gets to enjoy it. You can't do that in any other entity. And you can't, you can't do it if you go buy that ticket yourself, and you want to then give it to your, to your family as a gift 
after the fact, you don't, you're not giving them a dollar. You're giving them $15 million, and you're going to put a load of tax on it. Or that's the purpose of having a partnership. That's just an aside. So I win the lottery, I form a partnership. You, you know, you've already formed, no, no, no. You've already formed that partnership. It's perfect. You, you already have that partnership in place before you get, the, you knew that before you bought the you, ticket. Before no, you bought that ticket, and everybody, you know, all the four, there's four of you, and you each put a quarter down, mm -hmm. okay? You, before you bought the ticket. After you win, you're tax free. See, I was this, I was playing out here, everybody the ticket disappeared on them, so now I have to deal with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, then go back to the guy, the guy with a lot of his home, tells his wife, I, I want a lot of pack your bags. Oh my God, where are we going? You can go anywhere you want, just pack your bags. <laughs> All right, sorry. And I don't mean that to be sexist, that go in the direction. And in, in my case, it happened to be, not me personally, I wouldn't be standing here. Um, I'd be off on my 100 foot yacht, not the house in the example before. Um, it happened to be that it was a woman who was. Uh, probably in her 20s, and she was an accountant working in the clerk's office of some county, and hit it. And her mother was a, uh, a client of my stockbroker at the time, and called me. You know, the, the broker said, hey, I have somebody refer to you, and I got together with my tax partner, we put the whole thing together, and she's still a client. It's quite a long number of years later, she built the house for the family, she built some businesses, all the right things. Not the bad stories that you hear, where somebody takes the money and blows it off. She actually invested the money. The first check she got, I mean, she got, took installments and it's almost like 600000 a year before taxes. So the first thing she did was she wanted a piece of land and build a house for the family. She told me when the second check came in a year later, that's when she knew it was real. And then so she started to buy a couple of condos, a couple of pieces of property. And then she said, we should have a business. So she and her husband bought a liquor store which is a real business, plus it's a little bit of fun. And a couple years later, they bought a piece of land across the street from the liquor store, and they built a building, and they moved the liquor store into half the building, and they rented out the other half. So they, they're growing businesses. And she went a second liquor store, then a third liquor store. So this is, this is, this is one of the few good motto stories that you hear. Is because they take it out of the draw? No, well, this is just a person that's an intelligent person that's a business person. I would take it out of the draw. Well, but, okay. <laughs> And that's great for you to say here, making jokes about it, but I'm going to tell you something. Go back to your morning class and, and sit down and do your numbers, and you will be surprised mathematically. Number one, how much money you lose taking it in a lump versus taking it in a draw? And there's a formula, I 40% or something. Like that. It's more than, it, it depends on the interest rates, and I'd have, there's actually a mathematical formula. I looked it up one time. If you go to the lotto site, they'll explain to you exactly how it's done, and it's based upon what the state is making on the fund that sits there, and how much how much they have to make to make the month the annual installments versus what the lump is worth. Okay, so you're going to lose sixty. Let's say you're going to lose half. Okay. All right. Now you have the half. Now go invest it. When you have a two percent market or a three percent market, and of course now because you're in here, you're going to do much better because you're going to buy real estate all over the place, but even so, you're going to pay income tax on that in, on that money, and you're going to have a lot less money to invest. Whereas if you take the installments, where you're going to have a lot more money, and you're going to pay less income tax because you're getting it in, in installments, you'll be able to invest it and roll it. Plus, you just over. It's a math formula. It's strictly a math formula. Now, if you're 70 years old and having this conversation, then you may not make it to get all the installments. Your family might get it, but that's a whole different analysis. Mathematically, in today's market, with today's interest rate environment, you're better off taking the installments. And this was this was my partner, who's a tax lawyer, has done this this more times than you would think. So would if occur. you were on the five hundred million dollar power bond, you would take the installments. Why not? Why not? How much? How, what are the installments? A hundred million? I don't know. What would be that enough for no. that? No. How much are the installments? I mean, maybe like two million, three million a year. If it's a thirty-year payout, you said how much? Four hundred million. Four hundred million. Do the math. It's going to be a lot bigger than that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah, probably ten. If it was six hundred thousand dollars on fifteen million, you do the math. Anyway. Okay. All right. And if you can't get by on that, okay, then take the lump. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got you know, So anyway, it's a mathematical thing. Okay. 
I got, I got sidetracked. It was a fun <laughs> sidetrack, but I got sidetracked. And, and by the way, that's real information. So, you know, it's all good. So, typically what you will find in a business arrangement, because you don't form these entities, corporations, LLCs, partnerships. By the way, the most popular today is the LLC for a variety of reasons. It gives you the, it gives you the liability protection of a corporation, but it gives you the tax benefits and flexibility of a partnership. So LLCs are what we see most of the time. You have an agreement among the owners. In the corporation, it's called a stockholders agreement or a shareholders agreement because that's what the owners are called. In a limited liability company, it's usually called an operating agreement, although the statute refers to regulations, which is the same thing. In a partnership, this is going to be a real stretch, folks. It's called? Partnership. Partnership. Thank you. <laughs> so, I would have been very disappointed if I didn't get that answer out of somebody. OK, so it's a partnership agreement. So what's in these agreements? A whole bunch of things are in these agreements. It's obviously names, addresses, blah, 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 all that kind of nonsense. But that's, that's not what's important. So when you have people to, that get together in business, a lot of the time, you have two types of people, two components. You have somebody with, that just won the Powerball, who's got all this cash sitting around, that has no idea what to do with it, and the other person who's got great ideas as to how to buy property and flip property and, and do all kinds of things, or maybe he's a developer, more likely, who's got a great plan to build um, a tower of mixed use, of just the right unit size, just what needs to be built in a particular location, but he doesn't have the money, and he doesn't have the credit. So these two people get together, and you get the funded guy and the idea guy together. And I've been doing this as long as I can remember, and that's, they come together all the time. So, when you put money into an entity, you want to take money back out of the entity. If you invest it in this equity, and it makes money, and you take it back out, it's going to come out and it's often going to have a tax consequence. But if you loan the money into the entity, then the entity will repay you the loan plus interest. And at least as to the principal in and out, there are no tax consequences. As long as it's not you know, thinly capitalized, that's a whole other building next door issues. But so a loan would be made to the entity by the funded person. The agreement the LLC operating agreement, will have a provision for that. And it will say, among other things, that before any profits are distributed, or before capital is returned to the rest of the owners, the guy that makes the loan is going to get his loan back first. Actually, the typical clause is going to provide first comes the interest, and then comes the principal to the loan, and then comes the principal to the other investors, and then comes the profit. I don't know if you've heard this in, in any finance courses, but the name for that whole litany is called a waterfall. That's, that's the industry name. You've probably heard that if you've done any kinds of sophisticated agreements or been involved in any deals. It's called a waterfall. And just imagine that all the money is up here and it's coming down into your hand. Who gets what first? And the order is interest on loans. This is after, this is after third party loans, mind you. This is only, I'm strictly talking internal. Interest to the person who put up um, the loan money, return of that loan principal, then return of the investor's investment, and then the profits. With one possible insertion somewhere up there, depending on who put in what. Sometimes in addition to an interest rate, the guy with the put up all the money gets something called a preferred return. So. Is that the same thing as a trench loan? That no, 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 no. <laughs> tranche, not tranche. Tranche. It's the same thing as a tranche. No. Okay. I'll tell you better. Okay. It's just, that's a buzz. That, that's a word that is like, if you're trying in the wrong circles, um, you will see people use that word to try and impress other people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Wall Street type of work. And basically, it's groupings of money is all tranches. So you could have, a, in bonds, for example, yeah, yeah, you have the senior bonds that get paid first, 
then the intermediate level, then the lower level. They have different attributes. One gets a lower rate of interest because they have a preferential payment. Uh, and each grouping is a tranche. And this is not Okay, no. This is, this is the priority of return of money. Sometimes the investor says to the, the, the guy with the bucks says, listen, I'm putting up the lion's share of the money. I can go anywhere and get a 6% return from somebody. So that doesn't interest me. I want my interest, I want my 6% interest, but if the project does well, then after I get my loan paid back, and before you get some of your profits, I want a preferred return. It's similar to the promote that we were talking about at the very beginning of class, maybe before class. It's, it's a bonus, if you will, to the guy that's putting up all the money, a preferred return. It's computed like an interest tax. Yes. So this is what they negotiate on Shark Tank at the end when they try to negotiate. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All of this stuff is negotiated. And yes, that's that's a situation because that's exactly right. That's exactly where this would come into play, where you have the guys that are putting up the money, but they're usually they're usually getting a piece of the equity. This is a little different. This is where they're really a partner. Where at the end of the of the day. After all the loans and the preferred return, they're going to be 50-50 because the equity money is equal. It's the loan that gets paid back first and the loan that carries the preferred return with it. Otherwise, then they, because what the, at the end of the, pro, uh, the project, after the development fees and after when there's profit, that'll get distributed equally. I mean, it's all, by the way, that's all negotiable. I'm just using that for an example. Okay, so the, the, it's a whole section of, of capital contributions and loans in one of these agreements. The next thing that, that gets talked about is management. Management, again, in a situation where you have the day-to-day -day guy who knows how to build real estate projects, he's going to be the one that's going to be dealing with the contractors and dealing with the architects and dealing with the lenders and so on and, and doing the day-to-day -day stuff. But money guy says, you can't go borrow money against the company assets. You can't sell the properties. You can't uh, commit the company to uh, an expense of more than $35,000, number out of the air, without unanimous consent of all the owners. That's a protection. Those are, are powers that require the manager to go back and get approval. And by the way, that's why it's very important if you're dealing with a company, as a lawyer particularly, when I'm looking at documents, I want to see that operating agreement. I want to see what restrictions, because we've had situations where we've represented title underwriters handling claims where a guy comes to the closing and says, I'm the manager, I have the authority, and here's, a, here's an affidavit that I have the authority, and you don't need to see the operating agreement. The operating agreement is not important. So they close the deal. After the deal gets closed, after the money's gone, the guy comes knocking on the door and says, hey, uh, I'm the other 50% owner, and my operating agreement says it has to be 100% unanimous approval to sell this property. Your transaction's invalid. You've got to see the operating agreement. You've got to see what prohibitions there are against, especially major transactions, is what the category usually is. Distributions, I already covered that. Distributions are going to say who gets what. Usually it's by percentage <coughs> of investment. There could be preferred returns. There could, be, there could be situations in a more complicated deal where one guy has agreed to, that he's going to get all the distributions, the other guy is going to get certain tax attributes. Unusual, but sometimes you've got your, your big investor has a lot of other income and needs the tax benefits. This could happen, say, in a, in a housing bond deal or, or some other complicated financing thing. And so they'll agree on, on that. The money is going to get distributed this way, but the tax attributes, and it can't just be the tax attributes, there have to be certain structural things in the agreement that are beyond the scope of this to make that legitimate, that will stand up with the IRS. Sale, obviously, the sale has to be approved by everybody in most cases. There are situations where you'll have a manager whose partners trust him. I have, I have a client who has partners in several deals. He's been working with them for years. Most of them are overseas. 
He has 100% control. He can sell the property. He can do whatever he wants. As a practical matter, he will pick up the phone and call his partners and say, hey, I have an offer. Do you want to sell it? Do you want to keep it? And I mean, that's just the right way to do business. But it is possible to vest the manager with 100% authority and to put it right there in the operating agreement. Otherwise, you would want some proof of authority. And anytime you're doing a closing, you're going to ask for all kinds of proof and resolutions. And you're going to want a resolution from all the owners authorizing this person to sell the property. What kind of business can the, can, can the company do? Well, if you're investing in a real estate development company, uh, you want to not find out, wake up one morning and find out the guy bought a grow house. Because that's not what you invested in. So inside the document, you're going, to, you're going to define what is the business and how far sideways he can go without coming and asking for approval. An exit strategy. Well, what happens if somebody wants out? What happens if somebody wants to sell their interest? Not everyone wants to stay in business with each other for a long time. So there's ways to do that. Uh, very often, you're going to have a right of first refusal. So be a situation. It's a, it would not be typical for someone to come and want to buy a minority interest in a closely held entity. But it happens. Uh, we're in partnership in, in some deal, and I have a friend that wants to come in and take over my position because he likes the deal. Well, you may not like him. You're my partner now. You and I have made this deal together, and you don't want you don't want to be partners with the stranger that I'm bringing in. So you get a right of first refusal. You, as my partner, it could be, it could be straight prohibition, or the entity that could have it first to say that if I get a bona fide offer, like any other right of first refusal, if I get a bona fide offer to buy my share of the company, I have to first offer it to the to the company itself. If the company doesn't exercise it, then the other members pro rata have the right to to do it. It just it protects the owners from having strangers. And then there's the deadlocks. And the deadlocks happen, unfortunately, more than you would expect, where we just are not agreeing. I want to build another tower. You don't want to go and, and take another construction loan. Uh, we have this great piece of land. You think that land is going to be worth more in the future. You don't want to sell it, but you don't want to go and commit to the construction loan now because there's too many units on the market. And we just can't decide what to do. We're done with the first tower. We've got this chunk of land, and we're just we're disagreeing. So what happens? Remember that, that contract I described before, the deadlock of disputes, where I come forward, and I offer to buy. I, I come forward with a contract with a price and terms and no name. That's how we solve that problem. It's, it's, it's colloquially called a shotgun clause, because basically, I'm bringing the shotgun to the table, and I can point it at you, or you can point it at me. And somebody's going to walk away owning the company, and somebody's going to walk away with a check. It's just a question of who says yes. What was our joint venture? So we... Okay, so a joint venture is a partnership for one purpose, as opposed to an ongoing partnership that could be for multiple purposes. It's a good real estate. Yes, actually. You don't see. I mean. It's a label you don't see very much because what will happen will be you and, I, you and I are developers and we do, you're developing over there, I'm developing over there, and an opportunity comes up that works for both of us to be together. Maybe it's a mixed use project and you're an office guy and I'm an apartment guy and we want to work together on the project. So we reach an agreement to do this together. It could be a joint venture agreement. We could form a new LLC and it could be inside the operating agreement. It, it is technically a partnership agreement or whatever for that one particular purpose. But the, the technical definition of a joint venture is a coming together for one specific purpose as opposed just to be in business together, which is really the definition of a partnership.
jump back into the lease area for a second because that's where you see these more than, and I'm talking about something that we're unfortunately a little too familiar with in South Florida, damage and destruction. Damage and destruction is when the hurricane comes through, tornado comes through, fire happens, less likely, at least here, and something bad happens to the property. So, first question is, what's been damaged? Well, I'm, I'm, for this context, at least for the moment, I'm going to, I'm going to stay where to lease the property. It doesn't matter whether it's an office or retail or anything else. What's damaged? Is just the premises damaged? If just the premises are damaged, we look to see, can the tenant continue to do business? And in that circumstance, the there's really a couple of different standards. The first standard is called tenantability. It's like the word tenant, but with tenantable. Tenantability means, can the premises be physically occupied? Can someone be in there and, and function, just physically be in there? You still have ceilings, walls, windows, doors. Yeah, you, that corner over there's got a stain where the, where the water came in, but it's okay, it's just over there, it's not a problem. So it's still tenantable. In that situation, you would have a partial abatement of rent where, let's say it was 10% of the, of the premises became untenantable, not able to be worked in, and so you reduce the rent by 10% to the landlord fixed that under the terms of the lease. However, in a more practical approach, and something that, that I fight for as much as I possibly can, is the definition of unusable. Unusable for the purpose that the tenant has leased it for. We're sitting in a classroom. Now, technically, in a, for what we're doing here, except for this nicety, if we were sitting here with a candle in the dark, I could still be talking to you. Okay, so we could theoretically continue to operate. The problem is, I don't see any windows that open, and it starts to get a little warm, a little stuffy. That would be a little unpleasant. And one might say, that's not an appropriate environment to conduct a class or to conduct an office operation or any other, or a retail operation. You can't breathe. Um, it gets more severe if you're in an office setting and everybody's got a computer in front of them that's plugged in, uh, as opposed to a battery-operated computer. Or you have to have lights on to see your documents because there aren't any windows. And because there aren't any windows, there's no airflow. So now your space is fine, but you have no electricity because the building generator hasn't been fired up in three years and doesn't work anymore. So even though when you rented the place, they told you it had a generator, it doesn't work. So you're out until the electricity is. So you have to carefully define that because there's a difference between untenantable, you can physically be in the space, there's nothing wrong, there's no, well, there is. Um, I didn't do that. It's just but I take advantage of my props. Um, that doesn't render it untenantable, as long as nothing's falling down or jumping down on me. But not being able to use it because you have no electricity, no air conditioning is unusable. And that's the definition you should be going for. So now it happens. Oh, so the other, the other situation is now it's the property that gets damaged. Now the landlord owns a, an office building or an office park, if you will, and half of it gets damaged, destroyed, where half of it becomes untenantable and half of the rent flow goes away. Your particular tenant space is fine. What happens? Well, in that case, in most lease provisions, and you have this in, your, in the lease that you have in the materials, if 50% or more of the property being, not the premises, but the overall project is damaged, then the landlord would have the right to cancel the lease. You're relieved of the rest of your obligation, you gotta leave. And the reason is because the landlord's gotta tear the whole place down and fix it, and so that's done. If it's, if it's untenantable, typically the landlord has a negotiated amount of time to restore the premises, during which time the rent should abate in most cases. There are cases where it's negotiated, again, it's all business issues, where the rent does not abate, and even though the tenant's a little unfair, but even though the tenant can't function
function in the space, the tenant has to continue to pay rent. Why? Because the landlord has made an agreement with the tenant that the tenant is going to continue to pay rent so the landlord can continue to pay the mortgage and the tenant is going to get business interruption insurance at his expense as part of the business deal so that he has the money coming in from the insurance to pay the rent. It's all a question of allocation of risk between landlord and tenant and who pays for what. The length of time to restore the premises, especially, especially important for two reasons. Well, the tenant's out of business. The tenant may have to go to another uh, space to operate. They have to rent temporary space. Maybe he's got to move out altogether. So the amount of time that the landlord has to restore is very, very important when it's damaged. And it's getting negotiated in, in the form of lease that I provided to you, something that I've been advocating for a long time, is to have two standards. One is a typical, normal problem, catastrophe, fire, storm, whatever. And the other is if it's a, an event of widespread geographic portion. For example, a major hurricane. When Hurricane Andrew came through and wiped out so much of Dane County and, and other areas, you couldn't get insurance adjusters for weeks and weeks. You couldn't get roofers for months. You couldn't do anything because there was so much destruction that it exceeded the capacity of the industry to repair it within a reasonable amount of time. But all these old leases said, well, you know, you'll have it done in 90 days. You'll have it done in 120 days, 180 days. Impossible. The other tweak to this is if you're going to have a set number of days, think about business days or think about starting it when the building permits are issued. Because if anybody's done any kind of construction stuff, you know that before you can put, start working on it, you've got to go to the city or county and get a building permit, and that can take three months. So it's all who, who bears the risk of the rent not being paid. And each side will want termination provisions in this circumstance to get out of the obligation to repair it, Tenant says, look, I can't wait six months for you to fix this. I have a time-sensitive business. If I'm out of business six months because there's damage, my business is dead. Therefore, if, it if it's reasonably expected it's going to take six months, eight months, whatever it is, I want out. I'm done. Landlords will usually push back on that because they have a property and they want to know after they spend the money and, and spend the insurance money, they want to know that they're going to have a tenant again. That time. Otherwise, they're going to have to repair it and go back out to the marketplace and go through the same thing they did in the beginning, which may be a bad situation uh, because the real estate market could be sour. This also goes back to who's insuring what. You have uh, you have the leasehold improvements that are typically insured by the tenant. You have the structure that's insured by the landlord. Uh, business interruption, all, all kinds of things like that that are paid for by the different parties. A lot of the same principles that apply to leases apply to mortgages, except for some quirks about the bank's right or the lender's right to take the proceeds. So it's a pretty basic mortgage principle that if there's a damage and if uh, the building is destroyed, the lender in almost every loan document has the right to take possession of the insurance proceeds and apply it to pay the loan down or pay the loan off. Usually it says that in the lender's discretion, the lender will make the proceeds available to the tenant to rebuild. Um, and that's normal because the lender wants the cash flow to continue and wants a loan. The problem, remember we talked about prepayment penalties? It's always an exception for damage and destruction, for casualty proceeds, insurance proceeds. The problem occurs with a multi-building property. I look at the room for an example. So here we have six buildings, seven buildings, sorry. We have seven buildings. Now the storm comes through, and the way the tornado comes down the street, it wipes out these two tiers over here. These two buildings are wiped out. And the lender looks and says, oh, well, by those buildings being gone, your debt service coverage ratio has fallen below the minimum. 
and it's going to take you too long to lease it back up, and we want the insurance proceeds to apply to the loan. Okay. Now, the borrower has a problem. The borrower has no money to rebuild the two buildings. The borrower also has a prepayment penalty, or maybe a prepayment lockout in the wrong kind of loan, where they can't pay off the rest of the loan. So now, they can't go and borrow, because everything in the room is encumbered, they can't go and borrow new money to rebuild the two buildings. They're screwed. So you have, and, and the, the lenders and lawyers, especially when they're located in areas that don't have hurricanes and things, don't understand why I argue about this so much. But what you should have there is a simple right to say, if this happens, and if you take the money, then you have to give us a window to pay you off so we can go and refinance and rebuild. It's, it's just practical stuff. Questions? Boring? I'm good? Sleeping? It's too early for that. <laughs> I'm used to this an hour from now. It's okay. <laughs> I, I, I think that's bad when you get to condemnation. Anybody know what condemnation is? Eminent domain? No, eminent domain. How'd you guess that? It was right next to that other one. Wow, see you're learning. I like that. Okay, this is <laughs> so the the con. I, I believe I believe it's the United States Constitution that has a provision that says that the government shall not take your property without just compensation. That's what this is all about. That's where this generates from. So ultimately, the government has the right to take your property for public need, public use. Why would they do such a thing? Because they want to build highways, public construction, uh, schools. Okay, whatever. So, so when you get into um, eminent domain proceedings, the only issue that gets argued about is only one issue. Uh, price. Big up. And that results in a trial, well, some of the times. No, it's good so. Because what happens is the state wants to pay as little as possible, the property owner wants more. Um, sometimes it's an opportunity for the property owner to cash in, get rid of the property. Um, I have a client of mine that's got a, a professional office in Aventura, and there, there's a road project about to occur. And the road project is going to put another flyover um, at, at, at US 1 and Ives Dairy Road. So that when does that happen? Well, they're they're working on the property. No, I mean I live like right by there. Okay, so okay. traffic already sucks. Traffic sucks. And here's here's the problem. Stay cool. The question. <laughs> here's the problem. The problem is that in order to go westbound, if you're going north and US one there, you have to go under the bridge, across the tracks. You know, even which is the thumpity thumpity bang of the of the. Uh, um, Right line, you know they like to splatter people all over the tracks. Mm -hmm. So I make that up. Okay. A lot of deaths since the year or the year and a half. Right. Yeah. 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 Don't 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 pick up. I know I shouldn't pick up the right line. It's not their fault. People are walking in front of it. Anyway, how many, how many it's, 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 it's like the highest rate of train-related incidents anywhere, and I don't know why that is. So, anyway, so people made a try rail. They think they could beat it. Trial was much slower. I uh, yeah, so they're like, oh, it's trial, I'm gonna beat it in snap. Snap, right? Trial was How many total, people have died? Trial totally uh, different. Like, like rail, they have died. died. <laughs> At least. A dozen. Really? Yeah, it's yeah. been more, more than necessary. Before so I so what they're doing is, that, uh, is they're going to build a thing, some kind of a flyover. It's going to look up on f dot, where it's going to be a ramp that's going to go up over the highway come back down around and take you west on Ives Dairy Road, which will eliminate the traffic light issues to make the turn, and it will eliminate the, cross, the railroad crossing. So that you don't get hit by train. So, why am I talking about this? So there's a gas station, I think it is, right there. The gas station is going to go away because the road is going to go right there. They're also going to cut right in front of an office building and the office building, if they lose any land at all, is going to have a major problem because they already have insufficient parking 
for their tenants. Now, when you're dealing with condemnation, in, in a leasing setting particularly, it's very, very unusual because, I don't know if you, if you, if you threw it in the example, but the, really, more than this kind of a major project, it's road widening. Mm -hmm. Where the two lane road's gonna become the three lane road, and they're gonna carve off a piece of the land, not the building, but that's where the parking lot is. So if you have a property that's tight on parking, when they carve the piece of land, all of a sudden it changes the character of the building. Sometimes it will take the number of spaces below what's required by governmental rule, and then you have a real problem. So that's one, one side of it to deal with. So what do they take? What do they take? Well, what happens if they cut into your parking and you fall below? Then the building the becomes then the building becomes unusable. And they have to pay for the value of the building. They 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 haven't actually physically taken the building, but they've taken enough of your property to cause your building not to be able to be used. Okay. I'm sure you can find that. However, what are the ramifications of fighting the government? Well, you can't. Value. Oh, so you can't fight the taking. You can fight the value. Yeah. So if they, obviously it starts off with a negotiation and they get discussions back and forth. No, there's, there was some, there are some cases that went to Supreme Court over in the domain. I'll get there in a minute. Well, thank you for, thank you for bringing that up. I was going to get there in a minute. Sometimes, more than sometimes, they go to trial. Because what you happens is you have the, the state brings in their appraiser, and you bring your appraiser, and each one testifies before the court as to what the value of the property is. And maybe it's the value, of, maybe the value of the property is being argued as how it sits today. But you know, I've got these plans from an architect to put a 12-story tower on this property, Ooh, yeah. and it was going to be worth so much more money. And I'm just getting ready to do it. And look, I even got my application for building permits, and the appraiser says yes, but that's the highest and best use. And based upon the fact that you're permitting it for that, it's now worth this instead of that. And the judge looks at that, and I don't know if that's a jury trial or not, but it could very well be. And because I, I mean, I had one partner who was a trial lawyer, did personal injury stuff and things like that. If you get up and you do a dog and pony show in front of the judge, then it doesn't matter what the topic is. You start presenting all the cases, and, and you start presenting your arguments and the, the appraiser's valuation to the judge, and the judge is going to come up with a number. Yeah, okay, so the, the, there, was a, there was a famous Supreme Court case that took place in New London, Connecticut. You had some good examples of things that are a public purpose. So a public purpose is easy. You can put a road, whether it's a flyover or a, a widening. Is this the 2005 decision of the Supreme Court on that one? I can't tell you what year it was. I only know it was New London, Connecticut. I'm going to tell you what happened. Okay. I did, it's like, it's like I, when I was in school, I never remembered case numbers because it doesn't do any good to know what book and page it's in. You can always look that up. And so the 2005, in terms of when the case I, occurred. I just remember the Supreme Court passed it. Uh, 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 I will go into it after you say what you're saying. Okay, so here's, here's what happened. There was an area of town that the town said was blighted. Blighted. It, it's crappy. It needs to be redone. It's, we we want to make our town better, more valuable. There's run down and dilapidated houses, and and it's just it's a mess. Hold it. Yeah. So so what they did was they went in and they did a taking and a domain. And the town, the, the, the state took it over, the town city maybe, took it over and acquired the property. And instead of building a school or a road or whatever else, they turned around and sold it to a developer to rebuild. Well, the people went nuts. This isn't the public purpose. You took this and gave it to another private developer to make a profit. That's not proper. You took our house on the river away from us that my family has lived in for a hundred years, and you can't do this. And the, the county, the government authorities said, yes, we can, because this whole area in which your house is, sorry about your house, but this whole area is falling apart. 
It's dilapidated. It's, it's, it needs to be cleaned up because it's ruining our town. And it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yes, you can do that. That it was a sufficient public purpose to allow the condemnation. Well, would that justify a higher price, though? No. Like, can you Actually, argue what their usage is, is based, like, that's how you could justify an extreme price? Like, oh, you want to build a highway? Well, then, you know, my little shack here is worth $10 million. But I, no. No? The, the proposed use doesn't dictate the price. Really? But, okay, so when I studied this before, it was, this whole case was around CRAs were taking, CRAs was community redevelopment agencies, and I thought it was ruling against it that CRAs were no longer allowed to do that. What CRAs were doing is using intimate domain to say slum and blight and take their property and sell it. And they were doing this all over, and this was all the way up until 2005. If uh, a great study in this area, if you want to research it, what happened in the area, what happened in Sistrum is a good example, where they were taking people's property through intimate domain, and then they were giving it to investors to redevelop and build. And in, in the case in 2005 that came through, the Supreme Court decided to say that no longer uh, CRAs or any government agency could take land to give it to a developer to develop, unless it had to be for public purpose. Public purpose is defined as um, public housing, schools, so it can't be, or public partnerships. So it cannot be where they take it and sell it or give the land away to a developer to alleviate some of it. It has to be a public I think, partnership. I think, but I think the New London case specifically dealt with blight. The blight, yeah. As opposed to what you're saying with the CRA just wants to make the town nicer or, or redevelop. This was actually a blight where it was deemed to be a public purpose. A little unusual compared to what you're describing, and I understand what you're describing with the CRAs, but this particular one was different. Okay. But isn't a blight just a look? What's that? If light is just, it's ugly. No, it's not much more than the look. What, much more. What is that? It's, it's a whole deterioration of a part of town. Uh, but there, there were parts of, of cities that everything was empty. The, the, there were, it was derelict properties. I hate to use it for example, Detroit. When, 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 when things got really bad in parts of Detroit, properties were just crumbling. Nobody lived there. There was crime going on. Uh, they become unsafe structures. It was just deteriorating. No, it's not just luck. Okay. Um, you know, I heard that the government usually, when you do try to fight the value and you try to negotiate things like that, they tend to lower the, the value or, or give you an offer. This is more for residential, what I've heard, um, in order to, to get you out quickly, right? To put pressure on you. Does that happen? And then get to the condemnation part. Does that happen in commercial as well, if they wanted to? Like that strategy of like pushing this, okay, you want to find me, so then now you value, if you value it was $100,000, now it's going to be $80,000. Well, like, like any other negotiation, they're going to come and they're going to offer you less than less. what they think they can buy it for. I mean, that doesn't matter. That doesn't have to be the government. That's private as well. Okay. If you go to buy a piece of property, aren't you going to start a low offer? Right? Yeah. Okay, that's normal. So, and you know, they also take into oh, very, very important that, that adds to this process that you should be aware of. When the state comes and does this, and this is by statute in Florida, anyway, I think it's probably everywhere. If they take you to trial, or even if they don't take you to trial, they have to pay all of your attorney's fees. The government, the government does, has to pay you all of your attorney's fees because it wouldn't be fair to take your property and pay you just value, just compensation, but subtract from that what you have to pay to get to your just value. So they have to pay your attorney's fees. Win or lose? What's that? Win or lose? Yeah. There is no win or lose. <laughs> there is no win or lose in, in condemnation. You've got to, you, you must give them the property unless you could make the argument successfully that it's not for a public purpose. You don't have, that's not, that's not subject to dispute. Value is the only dispute. Okay, so. I don't, don't, I mean, I understand, I understand the special cases, the CRAs. No, I just was going to ask you a question. So, uh, if, would we consider Turnpike a public purpose? Yes. No. Even if you have to pay to be on Turnpike? Yeah, that's not, that's just how you pay for the Turnpike. Yeah. So, let me explain how that works, and, and I'm going to, 
This is because a turnpike is not actually owned by the government. No, it's yes, it privately is. Well, sure it is. It's privately owned. No, it's not. No, it's not. So here's what happens. This is a big deal. Let me ask you. Okay. So, <laughs> how do you, how do you, when you build a turnpike or 95 but the, or any other way, or any other road, how do you pay for it? Tax dollars, but the turnpike wasn't paid by tax dollars. To some extent it was. Maybe, uh, I haven't got to this yet, this is supposed to be for next week, but since we're under time a little, I'm gonna delve into this a little bit. So one of the ways that the government finances things is bonds. bonds. Okay, so you, as an investor, you can call a stockbroker and buy municipal bonds. Municipal bonds are issued by governmental agencies. Right? Why are, municipal, why are municipal bonds issued? Because the government wants to borrow money to build things, to do things. How do you pay back bonds? Well, there are general obligation bonds, which are paid out of regular state funds. General obligation, there are, there are specific revenue bonds that come out of specific revenue of specific projects. For example, they could, in a lot of cities, Miami being a, a glaring exception, if they wanted to build a new arena or a new um, stadium, very often the state or the county would float a bond issue to borrow the money to finance the construction of the arena. There was a guy by the name of Joe Robbie who owned the Dolphins who came in here and built what was then Robbie Stadium with private money. It was never borrowed money, it was never any state grants to build that, that stadium. That was a, a big fiasco when they started changing the name and selling the naming rights because they, a lot of people felt it should be attributed to him because he didn't take any public money to build it. So he raised it all from investors. So back to the turnpike. So now you have a bond issue floated to build the turnpike. And the, and the, the cost of paying the bonds back, in part, comes from the toll revenue. Also, what you may notice on the turnpike different from driving on parts of 95, particularly when you get away from South Florida, is it's usually really well maintained. You won't fi you'll find that periodically they're repaving it, so it's not bumpy, it's smooth, it's well landscaped, the guardrails are in good shape. Why? Toll money. So that's not going in anybody's pocket. That money is being collected to maintain that road so that it's not being maintained by the state. Most places have toll roads. You, you've been in Orlando lately? Oh, I've been living in Orlando. Okay. So if you have a, if you, in the days before the Easy Pass and the Sun Pass, you were throwing quarters and dollars and things. Every five minutes you were pulling through a toll. Ching, yeah. ching. Yeah, it was, was just, crazy. That's how I was in Orlando for a Okay. It was crazy. Now, you're going through, you know, luckily you've got the thing on your windshield, but it's it's nuts. Well, what happened was they built this whole network of roads through the, you know, away from the, the theme park areas, and they built these big it's a big circle. Big circles and loops and all kinds of things, and they had to pay for it. So how'd they pay for it? Buy money, revenue bonds, paid for by the toll money. That's where the tolls go. Okay. There's all kinds of bonds and they're used for all kinds of different things. They could be bonds to build schools. There could be bonds to build a water plant. Um, it's all, a bond is a, basically a borrowing, a mortgage almost, at the governmental level. But the reason I say that is because the bond that was to for the term I just paid back years ago. But they keep using the money for improvements, growing it. How about, how about the, 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 when they built more of the term they went all the way down to Homestead? and all the interchanges and all the widenings that they do all the time. How about the interchange for, for the stadium? That wasn't original. That turnpike stopped at, at, at Golden Glades. It didn't go loop around down to, you know. But because basically, again, I've got some history to this. Basically, you had something called the Palmetto Bypass. I know this sounds weird to, to you guys because, you know, what you see today, but. What we know now is the Palmetto Expressway 826. That was the perimeter of civilization. <laughs> so, so you say you looked down that way? Yeah, I did that. Okay, so that was the perimeter of civilization. First of all, it was not a limited access. It had, it had cross streets and 
It had, you could make U-turns and you'd go through the medium, make a left and go off here. It was, it was the Palmetto Bypass. It was a road that you took to go, if you wanted to go around Miami and down towards the Keys. It then became a limited access expressway. And of course, things grew out. The turnpike extension basically became the same thing at a different perimeter. Went out and around again. Same type of shape and same area, but it extended, again, extended the perimeter. And, and the so-called, now there is going to be some ridiculous shopping center that's going to dwarf sawgrass that's going there. Oh, you know, is it the Florida Mall or something they call it? No, no, the Florida Mall is Orlando. Uh, it, I forgot the name of it. It's so basically where I-75 and the Turnpike meet, right out there. Uh, is it just one that has to, it's going to have the theme park inside? Yep, yep. The, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be as big or bigger than the one that's in Minnesota. Minnesota. I think Minnesota is the second largest or the largest? Maybe. I think it's the largest. It's actually going to be a part of the time. Yeah. It's, it's going to have a... Or something like that. Yes. Thank you. That's it. What is it so, called? American Dream. So that's what... The, so, so municipal bonds are borrowings by the government. Those are public bonds. The, the number one feature of issued by the state is that they are exempt from federal income tax. The interest on the municipal bonds is exempt from federal income tax, which makes it a very attractive investment for wealthy people that pay a lot of tax. You hear people talking about their bond portfolios and owning bonds. The problem is the interest rates are so low right now, um, you're not getting a great return because the interest rates are lower than taxable rates because of the fact you don't pay any taxes. So historically, when you pay 8% to borrow money, you can take a big, they, they could get bond money for four or five percent. That's it. Today, that would be a great amount of money to get. Well, first of all, there is some other way that they, that they you know, try to raise money, which is, I don't remember the name, but it's, it's like a tax that they put on property, right? And then you say, oh, we need to build like a new school here. So they tax. And school tax. So just, just well, there's assessments, there's yes. impact fees. Um, Going, they, they do a lot of tourist tax too. Well, that's, those are taxes. See, see like Florida. That. Remember, Florida has no. Florida has no inc personal income tax and no estate tax. So they got to raise money somehow. So we have sales tax, real estate taxes, what are the resort tax? tourist taxes, the resort, resort tax. tax. These are all Every, things. These are all things that are being imposed on the, the tourists that are coming Airbnb. in. What's that? Airbnb is suffering a lot right now with all these. They're getting mad with the Airbnbs with the, uh, the resort. That's a whole different issue. The Airbnbs is a whole different issue because what's going on now is there's legislation proposed at the state level to prohibit municipalities, cities, from saying, no, you can't have short-term rentals. Uh -huh. uh, it's, it's being fought by the condo committee because you know, you live in a residential condominium, and I don't want people renting the unit next to me by the week. It's, it's not a hotel, it's in my home. Mm -hmm. So as living in that kind of a building, I don't want to, I don't want that. You wouldn't either. It's one thing, if there, there are buildings that where there's predominantly renters, and that's okay, and even that, not, it's not necessarily, there's nothing wrong with renting the place where you live, but maybe you don't want because uh, I, I lived in, a, I lived in, when I was first out of school, I lived in a nice high-rise kind of meeting in Miami where most of the owners were investors. A lot of South American investors came up, you know, they would come for a week with their families when it was a school thing, they owned the unit, and they treated it like a hotel. The kids would run wild in the hall, and they didn't care. They, they had no pride of ownership because it was just a, a place to come and stay for a week. And they treated it like crap, and it was, it was horrible for the people that live there full time. They would come up and just, you know, and it happens anytime. Transient, you don't want to mix transient and personal, uh, you know, permanent. It's a, that's why there's land use and zoning, which we'll get to. That, that's delving, I'm delving into, the, into my next outline, because um, the discussion's taken me this way. I want to talk about the different kinds of financing and um, how subdivisions are created and done what happens with taxation and things like that. But that's, that's certainly not something to start the when we hit zombie hour.
Is there certain zoning laws that keep, because I, I work at the, uh, for Palm Beach County, for zoning and planning, and I have people call every day, like, people next door to me are renting. Is that prohibited? Every day. Is it prohibited? Not, not typically. Sometimes. Depends where it depends, you're it depends. It, it could be prohibited by subdivision restrictions. It's usually in like, it's not usually in like, um, it's not usually in zoning. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't, yeah. think, I don't think it's ever in zoning. It's like an HOA thing. Right, think. I'll tell you why. So zoning, or land use, and again, I, I'm happy to, to start on this, it's like a preview if you will. Zoning and land use says, over here you can have residential, and over here you can have commercial, and over here you can have industrial. You cannot regulate, and it's actually been <coughs> litigated and, and made even statutory. If it's zoned residential and you put a house or more importantly an apartment building on that site and it's okay for zoning, you cannot regulate under zoning whether that form of ownership is rental, where the whole building is owned by a company and they're renting it, or condominium. That is not change in land use. And so zoning can't regulate that. So therefore, similarly, the house, can, is, it's a house. Is it being used as a house? Yes. Is it being used for residential purposes? Yes. Is that what zoning allows? Yes. Is it a single family house being occupied by one family? That's all you're allowed to do from a zoning standpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, HOA, not every property is in HOA. A lot more in Palm Beach County than, than some other places because of all the development that's taken place through there, you know, where, where you have the communities that have been built specifically, but it's not regulated by the government. That's where, that's where the statute I referred to is going to cause a problem because the state legislature is trying to make this change. They're trying to say no, the HOAs can't regulate it, and no, the cities can't regulate it. Actually, for Lauderdale, for example, we, I was talking before my example about buying the, the, the Osman buying the house with a 100 foot boat. In Fort Lauderdale, you're not allowed to rent your dock. If you live in a home, a single just renting a home and you have a dock, you're not allowed to rent that to somebody to keep their boat there. That's silly. Is it? Yeah. It's, your ha it's a house, it's not a business. Yeah, but I mean, how often are they going to come and grab their boat? I know someone that does that and he makes yes, like, like $12,000 a year or whatever he pays. And, the guy never comes. Why do you always come up with stories that someone's like doing some BS over here? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you think? He, I mean? he lives in he lives in um he lives in uh Palm Beach. So no, the seven ten. Oh yeah, that's illegal, right? You know. Oh, but I know people that do that all the time. <laughs> Shit, I do though. I do down here. I no, he's right though. It does happen all the time. So what happens is, I mean, yes, it's it's, it's maneuvering, okay? And it's not illegal. It's just a cloud on title. Don't get the, don't don't mistake that. Oh, illegal's got to be bad, prohibited. Illegal's got to be prohibited. Now, renting the dock space is illegal <laughs> because there's an ordinance that says you may not rent your residential dock. Well, now, what, the, what your friend that you know may have is he has a friend of his who's keeping his boat at his house and contributing to the expenses of the electricity. <laughs> <laughs> very, very similar to very similar to the um, the service dog. Did I, did I not come back with that? I, yeah. I was, yeah. Yeah. Well, because I, the, after I talked about it, I read an article that there is an absolute difference between the service animal and the emotional support animal. Did I? Yeah. Okay. So, so no, that's that's defined. I'm giving you a wiggle because I know. There seems to be a large gray area with how people That's operate. That's how people it's operate a boat. Well, <laughs> operate their um their their real estate. That's not that's not a gray area. That is a that is an ordinance in Fort Lauderdale. In Fort Lauderdale though. Yeah, in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. So it's you cannot you cannot rent your dock use your dock for commercial purposes. It's not to say you can't your friend can't leave his boat there. <laughs> or like in, or like in Palm Beach or something, right? <laughs> what? Like it, it, it differs based on, on the city. Why don't you ask the question it's open? Sitting next to you. Yes. Is Palm Beach prohibited? Um, it, I don't know. I don't have a boat. I don't know. I don't have a boat. 
And right. something, again, that's the kind of thing that you wouldn't know unless you looked up or you had experience with. That's, that's the case with most, most of these things. Unless it's something you're dealing with on a regular basis, land use regulations and, and zoning and things are they're very specific. And you, I, you know, I look them up all the time for specific things like that. But it's going to govern uh, what you can do with a piece of property, how much you can build on a piece of property. I, I don't have, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm previewing. I'm going, because I might as well, because we have the time and we've started the conversation. So, actually, I was curious about what the surviving was. The what? Yeah. Surviving. What that means, surviving. Where? H. Uh, H. Surviving. 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 Oh, sorry. It's down there. It's supposed to say surviving down terms. Down terms. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, the printed, the printed one. It's, it's called it's a return. I think Cole mentioned typos causing a problem. That's a typo. <laughs> so I, I went to this um, Hilton conference. And there is a woman, she works at a Hilton that's by the Dolphin Mall, I think she okay. said. And apparently there's some like, um, like a high end, of, I don't know if it's apartments or houses, that people started to Airbnb, but the city... By the Dolphin Mall? I think it was, or I don't remember what mall, but it's somewhere in Miami, that's where. Yeah. But um, there was a neighborhood where a lot of people were airbnb their houses. Making a lot of money. But wouldn't the city, have anything to do with Super Bowl, would it? No, it okay. was just a regular thing. And um, I think it was the city who stopped it. Like, they can't anywhere in that. It was a very high end area. None of them could Airbnb their houses. Oh, they break Because it was, no, because it was interfering with hotels and tourism. Like, hotels weren't well, getting my, any I business. Think Miami Beach closed on that, right? Well, remember, so, so you've got a different kind of a use. That's, well, that's why there's so much controversy about the Airbnb model. When you have a hotel... Because do they use tourism tax, Airbnb? So why don't they put them on there? That's so, because, because it's unregulated. That's, that's what they're trying to control right now. So when you have a hotel, you have state examination. Mm -hmm. You have the city coming in. And I just, had, I just had a point. We got a notice of violation because the city went in and their defibrillator stations were missing something. And there must have been eight violations because there must have been eight stations. And whatever it was, was missing. And so they had, all they had to do was correct the missing part, and then the violations would go away. But the building inspector, what they do, they're just mean and grumpy, and they walk in and they look for things wrong. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a hole over here. I don't know what's behind that piece of wood, but there's a gaping hole. Something could come through it. So, you know, they'll come through and violate it because that's allowing internal air to escape to external air. Whatever. So, so, but that's what they do. They're just, they're usually the mean and nasty, they suck on lemons and they go inspect properties. <laughs> <laughs> that's code compliance. That's different from zoning, obviously. Zoning says what you can do in a particular area with a piece of property. The code, the, the, the code is what prohibits certain uses, renting the dock, Airbnb, um, you know, they're, they're, they're tied together. Zoning is actually part of the code. Code of ordinance is what I'm talking about. So you have, at the municipal level, you have laws that are in codes of ordinances that are different than the state statutes. State statutes are regulated statewide. The county has ordinances that are countywide. The city has things that are citywide. We're all basically the same thing, but they're at different levels. So they can pass something and say no Airbnbs within the city or no short-term rentals within the city. We had a project approved for apartments to be constructed, and the city didn't want to pass it. They don't have the law in the city, but they made it a condition of approval that we had to file something in the public records that we couldn't have leases less than six months. And that, that was a negotiated condition because before the client went before the, the, the city council to get the approval, they were told nicely that, you know, it would help you get this approval if you agreed to do this. And that's how it works. 
you know, they were a little unhappy about it because they thought that some of the apartments might be available to someone coming into town for a one month study course, for example. So that was just an example that was thrown out. But they, they, they wanted the approvals, so they gave in to the requirement. If the state had, if there's a, if a state statute gets passed, the state statute will supersede the local ordinance. And the whole purpose of it is to to do just that, to eliminate that. And there's just for corporate to corporate leases. When somebody comes in and they have to do a job, let's say like a CEO. Okay, but there's but there's places. specific but there's specific places like a residence in for that. Or, or a corporate housing, whatever, you know, there's different, but that's that's regulated by the hotel division. So they're gonna make sure that it's clean, that it's safe, that um, the defibrillator has the right plug, whatever it is that's wrong with the thing, but that's what the, that's what the municipalities and the state do to make sure that those businesses comply with the rules that make it safe for you to go and sleep there. There's companies like Docs that are that literally are like Airbnb that allow people to rent their Docs out. So I'm guessing it's just according to code. It's code. It's, that's it. it. that's, that's strictly local for Florida. Mm -hmm. it's, it's municipal code. Maybe <laughs> Pompano doesn't have it. Maybe Miami <laughs> doesn't have it. Maybe Bal Miami Beach doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. So you know you don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be There's smart for Docs Airbnb to Docs like get? Well, I'm sure people probably wouldn't want to. Airbnb is just a referral service, you know? Yeah. They're not, they're not renting the house out. They're a referral service. They're putting, it's, it's a, what's called a peer-to-peer -peer network. So what they're sure, doing is you have your house and you're going to be away for a month and you hook up with Airbnb, an arrangement that you're asking them to find you somebody that will rent your house from you for a month. That's all. That's all it is, is you are, they're just a, basically like a broker, and you're paying them a fee for that. They're not, they're not taking care of your house. I don't even know if they screen the, the potential tenants, I don't think so. Uh, no, so, I've so seen some horrible areas. And conversely, they don't, I don't know if they screen the properties. There's a, there's a, there's a good know. documentary well, there's, there's, oh, there is. about the downturn of, uh, because of all, like, oh. and stuff. Oh. They're having issues everywhere, so. even in Europe. Yeah, did you hear uh, so about, you should there was a family. Take a look at it. There's a really good documentary about it. You know the thing that's supposed to detect CO2? Yep. There was a family who stayed somewhere who weren't up to date, and they all just died in a fleet because there was a lot of, but it's stuff like that, I guess. Get rid of vacation. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's why you should stay in a nice regulated hotel. That's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the purpose. It's a safety thing. Okay. Then the surviving downturns. Sorry about the title. I think I actually. Hmm? Surviving. Don't you? Surviving. So I think <laughs> I went through most of this stuff in one way or another, but I guess. And it's back to the leases to a large extent. It really boils down to, to working with somebody in bad times as opposed to enforcing all your legal rights. So half rent is better than no rent. If you're a landlord and the economy is bad, so you know if you evict the tenant, you're going to have an empty space. So maybe you make a deal with the tenant and say, look, I know you're suffering, everybody's suffering. Pay me half the rent for the next year. At the end of the year, let's, let's, we're gonna go back to regular rent. In two years, we're gonna to go to regular rent plus 25% so you can repay me what, what I'm, this. Or, I'm gonna let you sublease half the space. Maybe it's not a, a broad economic downturn, maybe it's simply, a problem with that particular business. So now you say, you know, okay, so you have this, you have this lease. I'm not going to let you out of the lease, but I'm going to let you rent half your space to somebody else who's going to come in and operate there. That's going to pay you. That's going to help you pay the rent to me. That's that's where the sub is. Forbearance is typically in a mortgage foreclosure situation. I talked about mortgage modifications. I think last week or the week before, where the bank will let you stretch your mortgage out over more years, lower the interest rates. Forbearance agreement is coupled with that, and it basically says as long as you do pay the lesser amount, 
we're not going to foreclose and throw you out. And a forbearance can be in any contract default. It can be in a lease, it can be in a mortgage, it can be any contract where there's a default and the person who has the ability to enforce the contract doesn't do so for a period of time based upon an agreement to let somebody perform or partially perform or work it out. So that's all workouts. An, an abatement, an abatement as opposed to a forbearance, an abatement is when you are forgiving rent or temporarily forgiving rent. Uh, an, best example of this, well, you, we all heard about what we call free rent at the beginning of a lease. You move in, you say, that's a rent abatement. That, that says, okay, in consideration that you're going to move in here and start a new business here, no rent for the first three months. Sometimes it's all rent, sometimes it's just base rent, and you've got to pay me your, my expenses. What you see, what I'm seeing more and more is, if back in the default provisions, if they've abated that first three months, and then Two years from now, into a five-year lease, the tenant defaults. Among the other things that the default provision has is they've got to pay back that abatement because they, they haven't performed the contract. They've been bad. Reductions. Okay, now that takes care of my bad stuff. Questions. earlier than normal. Do you want me to stop? <laughs> it's a democracy. Okay, well, listen. Yeah. I, would, I would rather stop. Uh, What's that? <laughs> He's going to still come up No, no, no. I repeated what she said. I repeated what she said. I, I, would, I would rather cut off early when I know that you're not absorbing because I can tell than to start new material that I'm just wasting my breath and you're not enjoying it and you're not learning anything from it. Because it's not, it's not, it's not about the minutes, it's about what you get from it, in my opinion. I hope you agree with that. Totally. Okay. <laughs>